to talk to you today about, the, about infinite exponential growth, why that's impossible in a finite world, and what that possibly has to do with agriculture. If you'd asked me 10 years ago, or asked my family and friends 10 years ago, I'm sure they would have said that I was the least likely person to ever be speaking to you about this topic. I graduated from the University of Chicago with a degree in economics. I went immediately to work on the floor of the Chicago Board of Options Exchange. I worked for 15 years as a derivative and bond trader. But one of the things that always bothered me in finance was the idea that we constantly had to be growing. I couldn't understand why it isn't that a company or a country or the world in general couldn't be rich enough. Why do we always have to be growing? Why do we always have to be consuming more? I think part of that is human nature. Um, but even in finance, one of the first things that you learn is to discount present future cash flows into the present. And I think what that does is devalues the future at the expense of the present. And so, and that, that was something that always bothered me, but I never really understood it or, or understood why it bothered me so much until I came across Dr. Albert Bartlett. Dr. Albert Bartlett is a professor emeritus at Colorado State University. He said the greatest shortcoming of the human race is its inability to understand the exponential function. The exponential function is simply a constant growth rate applied to a continuously growing base over a period of time. You can't open a newspaper, turn on TV, without seeing examples of this. We expect human population to continue to increase at over 1% a year. We expect the US economy to grow at 2 to 4% per year. In the last 10 years, the Chinese economy has grown at 9.4%. We see that all the time without really fully comprehending what it means. We expect that it probably looks something like this, but in fact, it looks like this. Um, there's another interesting implication that you can get from these growth rates, and that's how much time it takes for the size of something to double given a given growth rate. So you can use the rule of 70. The rule of 70 simply takes 70 divided by the growth rate, tells you how many years it takes for something to double. So in our example, human population increasing at 1% clearly doubles in 70 years. If the economy grows at 2%, it doubles in 35 years, and at 4% would double in 17 and a half years. The Chinese economy growing at 9.4% has doubled in the last seven and a half years. It's also interesting to see how quickly these doublings add up. So in only 10 doublings, the size of something is 1,000 times larger than it was at the beginning. And in 20 doublings, it's over a million times larger. Lastly, it's kind of interesting to see, too, that each of those doubling periods, the amount of growth, is greater than all of the growth combined before that. So in the last 10 years, the amount of growth in China was more than that had ever grown in the history of the country. So one of the, there was an interesting example I learned from watching YouTube of uh, Dr. Bartlett that you guys can can look up if you're interested. But it talks about how quickly time speeds up as you move along that exponential curve. So imagine, if you will, you have a bottle that has one bacteria in it at 11 p.m. The bacteria will divide once a minute so that the bottle's full at midnight. So you, as the average bacterium in that bottle, at what point would you start to realize that you were running out of space? What, at what time would the bottle be half full? That's easily found by just going one minute backwards because it doubles each minute, so it would be 11.59. But at 11.55, the bottle would be only 3% full, 97% empty. So I can imagine all the politicians in the bottle explaining that there was nothing to worry about. You have 32 times more space. Everything will work out. But in fact, you only have five minutes left. Now let's imagine that these ingenious bacteria go out looking for new bottles. So they start drilling in the Arctic, they frack, they use hydraulic fracturing to break up shale formation. They come up with three extra bottles. That wouldn't buy them much time at all. It gives them two extra minutes so that because they keep doubling every two minutes. The problem is not with enough resources. The problem is with the growth rate. We take this growth for granted simply because it's happened in the past and we assume that it will continue in, into the future, but that's not the case. There's an, one way of, of explaining that, basically, is with human population. If human population continued to grow at 1.3% per year, 
you would have one human for every square meter on the face of the Earth. This is something that's obviously not possible, but it shows you the absurdity of, of that assumption. So one of the first things you have to realize is in this growth, we're using incredibly, we're, we're assuming that natural resources can continue to, to be produced at these same rates. If you look at the graphs of natural resource demand, they all look very similar to this graph. But the problem is we live on a planet that has a finite amount of resources. We can all argue about how much of any one thing there is, but the fact is I haven't heard anyone arguing that we have more Earth. In fact, we're, we're basically consuming our capital stock to generate current income. Or another way of saying that is that we're burning the furniture to heat the house. This is especially true in modern agriculture. We're going to run up against the limits of this growth, perhaps first in agriculture, and if so, definitely most tragically. The amount of arable farmland in the world is actually decreasing because we destroy topsoil each year using bad farming practices and erosion. After many decades of increased crop yields through the magic of fossil fuel-based chemicals, when it we've been able to increase crop yields over that time, but now they're starting to, to flatten out as we reach the biological limits of the plant itself. Modern agriculture is incredibly reliant on fossil fuels. It's estimated that in this country it takes 10, 10 calories of fuel for every calorie of food that we produce. This is something that's absolutely insane. I think future generations will look back and, and say, you use this valuable natural resource that we had in the ground for no reason other than to just grow food. In addition, modern chemical-based farming destroys the ecosystem, the life, and the soil. It's estimated that in a single teaspoon of healthy soil, there are more microorganisms than there are people on the face of the earth. So it's with all of these things in mind that I became interested in farming. It's funny, maybe 10, 12 years ago, I went to hear famous investor Jim Rogers speak at Wharton. And in an answer to a question about career advice, he told the mostly MBA students in the room that they should all quit school and become farmers. I'm pretty sure that I'm the only person that listened to him. <laughs> but I know that in the future, the people that know how to grow food in a sustainable way are going to become even more important. So what is sustainable farming? If you Google sustainability, Walmart shows up on the first page. Monsanto uses the word sustainable in almost all of their marketing. But I'm pretty sure that these guys are not going to be part of the, the solution, but are probably instead part of the problem. So sustainable farming is really a grass-based perennial system. Grass is a perennial plant, so it doesn't have to be tilled or replanted year after year. By moving animals across the grass, using electric fencing to manage how they move, you can actually build life in the soil over time and build topsoil. We're really seeking to mimic the way that nature works. So you can think of cattle grazing as really trying to mimic the way that large herds of buffalo would move across the plains. We're really, in another way, we're converting solar energy into food. So if you think about it, we can't, we can't live off of sunshine. We can't even digest cellulose. But herbivores like cattle and sheep can. And so when, when they're harvesting their food from the grass and we eat those animals, we're, in, we're indirectly consuming solar energy rather than fossil fuels. Another important thing about um, the way that we farm is that by not tilling, we're also keeping carbon in the soil where it can be used, where, where it needs to be, rather than releasing it into the environment. So we can think back to high school science and the carbon cycle. Basically what happens through photosynthesis is that plants are taking carbon out of the atmosphere, sequestering it into the soil. The ways that that happen are not fully appreciated, but basically it relies on the micronutrients or microorganisms in the soil in order to do that process. When we use chemicals on the, on the soil, we kill that and stop the process. The good part is that this, is, this kind of farming is better for all forms of life. It basically is better for the soil microorganisms. It's better for the plants that, that live in that, or, in that environment. It's better for the animals that eat those plants. 
and it's better for us as humans and for our human communities. It's also interesting to think about water. You're going to see a lot more uh, water become a much more important topic in the future. If you look at the way that we handle water in this country, it's exactly backwards. We try everything we can to get water off of the land and into rivers and streams as quickly as possible. But in fact, we should be trying to hold that water on this, in the soil. When we till the soil, we're releasing carbon, which leads to further runoff and eventually leads to desertification. But if we can keep grass on the soil, we're able to hold that water where it needs to be. We typically think of surface water as rivers, streams, lakes, aquifers, but in fact, it's the soil itself. You can think of the soil as a giant sponge. When we increase the amount of carbon in the ground, we can increase the amount of water that that soil can hold. For every 1% increase in soil carbon, a meter of soil can hold an extra 16.8 liters of water. It's also interesting to think about how water affects climate change. When the sun's rays hit bare soil or concrete, that energy is turned into sensible heat, heat that you can feel, the temperatures raised. That's why the temperature is always higher in the city than it is in a grassy area. The opposite is true when the sun's energy falls on uh, saturated soil that has a biomass on top. Basically, that energy goes into latent heat. It's absorbed by the water vapor, and that thereby, thereby cools the temperature. The opposite is true at night. It releases that heat during the night and warms the temperature. So it's with all of these ideas in mind oops, that I decided, got interested in farming. So I found 350 acres of farmland in northern Chester County that was blessed with these beautiful old stone buildings. We spent two years restoring the buildings and the land. We're really lucky in this area in southeastern Pennsylvania. We have great soils, we have proximity to where people live, we have abundant water, and great transportation networks. So it's a perfect place to farm. I really truly believe that as fossil fuel prices rise and natural resources become more limited over time, we're going to have to find ways to grow food close to where people live. And perhaps even people will have to move out to where food is grown. One of our major goals on the farm is basically to grow food in a way that minimizes fossil fuel use. One of the easiest ways that we do this is by having people come to that place to buy their food so that the food hasn't traveled across the country or around the world to get to their plate. Another important way that we do this is by having the animals harvest the food themselves. So instead of using expensive machinery to till the soil, plant, cultivate weed, and then harvest the food, we let the animals do it themselves. So the animals, we use electric fencing to hold them in a certain area each day. We move them across, um, across the pastures. And they're doing all the work. It's interesting, too, to think about Cattle and sheep are herbivores, so they can live their entire lives on just grass. Some of the animals that we raise, pigs and chickens, though, can't live just on grass. They need other food sources. So in the past, this has typically been grains. But grains, grain production is incredibly fossil fuel intensive. And so um, it's something that's not going to be viable over the longer period of time. So one of the ideas that, that I'm really interested in is this idea of silviculture. So the idea basically is that you have multiple layers of perennial agriculture. So in the bottom you have grass, and then you have bushes and trees that, have, that are bearing fruits and nuts. Um, and I think these are going to be very important in the future. These are something, this is something that takes time to happen, but I feel like it has to, we have to start as quickly as possible. So we planted several hundred trees into our pastures to create, try to create this savanna environment. And in the wooded areas of our farm, we've also partially logged them to try to get grass growing on the ground. We also have over 50 kW of solar energy on the farm. So a lot of our electricity comes from solar power. We've converted our house to geothermal heating and cooling and solar hot water to try to minimize all the fossil fuels that we use. I often wonder why it is that more people don't see the problem with infinite and exponential growth. Uh, I'm certainly not the first person to think about this. In the late 1700s, Thomas Malthus wrote about how the geometric increase in population was soon going to outstrip 
our ability to feed ourselves. He had no idea that we would find ways to turn fossil fuels into food. But as we've seen, like, these fossil fuels are still subject to the same limits to growth that everything else is. The Club of Rome in the early 70s wrote a book called Limits to Growth, but its, its uh, implications have largely been ignored. I have very little faith that governments will solve this problem. I think it takes us as individual humans to try to take steps to work on it. I often wonder why it is that people don't see it. There's a great quote from Machiavelli, which I'll have to read, uh, that explains. There's nothing more difficult to carry out, nor more doubtful of success, nor more dangerous to handle than to initiate a new order of things. For the reformer has enemies in all those who profit by the old order, and only lukewarm defenders among those who would profit from the new order. This lukewarmness arising partly from fear of their adversaries who have the laws in their favor, and partly from the incredulity of mankind who do not truly believe in anything until they have had actual experience of it. My hope is that we, as a human community, can start to make these changes before we have to see the reality of the crisis. You can make a difference in how animals are raised and how food is produced every time you buy food. That has more, uh, more direct impact than anything else. My job is to just give you that alternative. Thank you. <laughs>